Our gospel for today comes from the 10th chapter of Mark. And as Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And the man said to Jesus, Well, teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And when the young man heard this, He was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. And then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is. How hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astounded. And they said to one another, who can then be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. And Peter began to say to him, look, we've left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields with persecution and in the age of the eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Our country, this country, is sick. It has a disease that is rampant among the populace. Its infection rate is the highest we've ever seen. No one is untouched by this disease. We have it ourselves, or our neighbor does, or a parent, and no one seems to be immune. It kills with impunity. Children, parents, grandparents, rich, poor, black, white, atheist, God-fearing, it seems to be worse among those who deny that they have it. And no, I'm not talking about COVID-19. I'm talking about a spiritual and moral sickness. It's a sickness of malice and disdain for our fellow children of God. Hatred for and lying about our neighbors. It's a sickness that pervades our culture. It's broadcast on cable news programs, talk radio and newspapers, and virtually dominates social media. This disease has turned our politicians into a collection of people who exist less to set policy and more to whip up anger and rage. This disease has given rise to what can only be described as a purely destructive spirit. Burn it to the ground so we can start over. This disease pushes us to loathe each other and to view the opposition as an existential threat. It makes us 
substantially exaggerate the extent to which members of the other party dehumanize, dislike, and disagree with us. This disease makes it normal to see others as an immediate and imminent threat to our well-being. And if we don't see them that way, people ask us, what's wrong with you? This disease, our malice and disdain, makes us vulnerable to misinformation. Misinformation is spread because it's profitable. Misinformation then builds more malice and disdain. And finally, there are entire media empires existing to do nothing but incite rage, to tell blunt lies, and deceive us by exaggeration and hyperbole against our fellow citizens and other children of God. We might even call this the hatred industrial complex. This disease attacks us directly and causes us to disregard as irrelevant the Eighth Commandment. You should not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, you all are good Lutherans. So the first question you should ask here is, what does this mean? It means we should fear and love God so that we do not lie about, betray, or slander our neighbor, but excuse him, speak well of him, and put the best construction on everything. This disease has infected left and right equally. We all think we are right in our own eyes. And we're okay with this, it seems. It's like we, we like being diseased. Malice and disdain are conditions of our soul. Hatred and lying are sinful symptoms of hearts that are filled with fear. Malice and disdain cut at the root of the Christian message of love and truth. The church, this church, should be a beacon of light and truth in this ever-growing darkness. This church should be an antidote to this spreading poison. But here we are, just as guilty, just as infected, just as diseased as everyone else. I can't even begin to tell you how many times when I or one of my colleagues has preached the gospel of Jesus the Christ that there will be people who hear it as nothing more than partisan rhetoric. Our ill-named culture wars, ill-named because these conflicts are destroying our culture, our culture wars have made the word radical a pol political swear word. But radical, in its original sense, means the root. It means the basic grounding assumption of an argument. And that's what Jesus is in this week's reading. Radical. This story is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's central to our belonging to and our identity as Christians. A young man, wealthy and a pious observer of the Judaic laws, comes to Jesus and says, how do I inherit eternal life? Inherit. What an interesting word to use. What does anyone do to inherit anything? Inheritance is more about belonging to a family than actually earning something. So Jesus says, Go, sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. Radical. A radical solution to a radical problem. Jesus says to the man, you lack one thing. What does he lack? He has money. He's law-abiding. People likely look up to him. If he is wealthy in this time period, he likely owns properties. That means he would also likely own slaves that take care of his properties and manage his household. So what does he lack? His response to Jesus' words is our clue. 
he goes away in shock and grieving. The Greek word here means even more than just a temporary emotion or feeling. It's a crisis of character. It's cut him to the bone. It makes him realize that what he has is an unhealthy attachment to money and power, a moral defect that will prevent him from entering into the humility required to follow Jesus. Radical. And we, too, have a moral defect. It's the moral defect of malice and disdain. We are addicted to hatred and lying. And our addiction is being fed by the media we consume and the friends that we have that buy into our anger and rage. If you haven't, I encourage you to see the expose on Facebook that was broadcast on 60 Minutes this week. Jesus' call is not to a life of poverty. It's called to a life of discipleship, to follow him. And what he does, as it says here, Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And then pointed out his moral defect. Jesus calls us to love first. A life of discipleship is a change in the social order. It's a conscious attempt to radically remove our moral defects. For the young man to remove his unhealthy attachment to wealth and power, he had to separate himself from his possessions and redistribute them among the poor. He needs to change his relationship to the poor to help them, to identify with them. Did the radical idea to give away all he had make you twitch? (laughs) All aspects of what it means to follow Jesus should make us twitch. We are deeply attached to our own ideas of self-preservation and security, not God's. The kingdom of God confronts us with a fundamentally different vision of what a good life is. A vision that is not focused on me, but rather on us. <laughs> now, we have an unhealthy attachment to malice and disdain. And we need to separate ourselves from our addiction. We need to stop listening to media that is designed to ramp up our outrage. And we need to stop posting on social media and having bitch sessions with our friends about how stupid or hypocritical or biased or dangerous the other side is. We need to go cold turkey from our addiction We need to change our relationship to the other side. We need to reconnect with them to find areas of common ground. We need to see that it is all about us, all of us, not just the ones on our team. We need to stand up and say no to malice and disdain and look at the other side and love the people. We need to stand up to our friends and say, I'm not going to be part of this. And then we need to point out the moral defect that we have shared and then hold each other accountable to following Christ. We need to make a radical change. Amos in this week's text says, For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins, you who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, and who push aside the needy at the gate. Therefore the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord of the God of hosts will be with you, just as you have said, hate evil and love good and establish justice. Radical change. 
change at the very root of who we are and how we relate to others. Hebrews reading today says, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So now, hearing God's word today, what will you change this week? What radical change will you make to stop the spread of malice and disdain? How will you ask God to heal you from this disease? Like the young man in the lesson today, we can ask, how do we inherit eternal life? For an inheritance has to be given and experienced. Someone has to die. We have to die to ourselves, to our egos, to our old ways of being in this world. Jesus died for you, and you, and you, and you, and me so that we can inherit eternal life. You may feel it's impossible to make this radical change. But for God, with God's help, all things are possible. We are sick. Our hearts are not at peace and are filled with fear. We think we can go it alone. Our moral and spiritual sickness can only be healed by the great healer, the healer of our every ill. The healer wants to bring us back into community, to sensitize us to the needs of others and remind us of our interdependency on others and on God. Let us pray. Healer of our every ill, give us peace beyond our fear and hope beyond our sorrow. Give us strength to love each other, every sister, every brother, spirit of all kindness. Be our guide. You who know each thought and feeling, teach us all your way of healing spirit of compassion fill our hearts amen
So 